And this is, uh, so I'll hand it over to Marcus Noble. Thank you very much. Yep, so I'm going to talk about webhooks and Kubernetes and kind of what is the worst that could happen. Um, I hope you're all kind of awake after lunch. I'll be at a nice lunch. Uh, before we get into that, let's just get to know each other a little bit. As I said, uh, my name is Marcus Noble. I'm currently a platform engineer at Giant Swarm. Uh, I'm a CVO ambassador and one of the new CNCF ambassadors, uh, in, as in the fall. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, if you want to talk to me about the, uh, this talk or anything else, uh, you can find me on Mastodon generally at marcus at kh.social. Or if you want to get in touch with me on any of the other thousands of platforms, everything's on marcusnoble.com. You can reach out to me and we can chat. Um, at this point, I've got about six years worth of running Kubernetes, uh, six years of experience running Kubernetes in production. Over that time, I've had a whole bunch of different roles. So I started out as an app developer, um, deploying... Uh, Node.js applications onto Kubernetes, so I was a consumer of Kubernetes clusters. I then moved into like a dev uh, a DevRel role, with, uh, not DevRel, DevOps role, sorry, um, where I was managing like a, a couple clusters for a single team. Then moved into more like R and D, where I was building out tooling for an entire company, and then finally into like a platform engineering role, where I was building, maintaining, and, and managing uh, clus clusters for customers. Um, so. I've kind of had a lot of different uh, personas working with Kubernetes and kind of the different ways that different people deal with Kubernetes and interact with it and all this kind of thing. So over that time, uh, I've hopefully learned a lot that I'm able to share with you um, and a lot of pain that I've had over that time that I'm about to share with you. So webhooks in Kubernetes are powerful things, um, but with that power comes risks. So before we get into that, I just want to make sure we're on the same page as to what I'm talking about when I talk about webhooks. We're specifically talking about uh, the, the webhooks within Kubernetes, so validating webhook configurations, mutating webhook configurations, um, the custom resource conversions with CRDs, and more recently, the validating admission policy, which is not technically a webhook, but in the same kind of area. We're talking about these sort of things. Um, there's a lot of uses uh, for these, these webhooks, for, the, for this functionality within, within Kubernetes. They've become quite a core part of pretty much every cluster that, that people work with. Um, so I loosely see these as grouped into four different categories. There's a lot of defaulting logic, so this is where your mutating webhooks come into play. This is things like injecting of image pull secrets into namespaces, so your Developer teams don't need to know those credentials. They can be handled automatically. Injecting of sidecars. So for example, Istio back in the day, it automatically injected a sidecar into all pods created, and that was through a mutating webhook. Um, there's also things like policy enforcement. So in an, in an enterprise environment, this is used quite heavily to make sure things like the latest tag is not used on any Docker images, because it's mutatable. Who knows what that could potentially pull down at runtime. It's not verified, and all this kind of thing. That's, that's generally enforced through a validating webhook policy um, and a bunch of other things. We've also got best practices. So this is things like ensuring that your clusters have things like pod disruption budgets or a minimum number of replicas in your deployments to make sure that the applications that you are deploying to that cluster are resilient, reliant, and can be kind of trusted. Um, sorry, the rest of my, my teams just showed up. <laughs> Um, and finally, like problem mitigation. So this is one of my most favorite areas where webhooks come into play within Kubernetes. Um, we've heard a lot about security throughout, throughout the day so far. Um, webhooks, especially mutating webhooks, can be used to actually avoid things like CVEs and stuff like that. So who, who remembers the, the Log4j issue from a few years ago where basically all Java applications became vulnerable to it effectively? Um, this could be instantly turned off through a mutating webhook. So there was a particular environment variable you could set in it with a particular value that effectively shut off the code path that was vulnerable. So we were able to fix our entire, we were able to, to, to mitigate this problem in, our, in, our, in all our clusters uh, by setting a mutating webhook that injected this environment variable into every pod that was created. Didn't matter if it actually had log4j or not, we just applied it to everything and then the entire cluster was safe. It's a very cool sort of thing you can do with this. So let's have a quick look at the, the life cycle of, of a webhook and how it plays in the API request and stuff. So in this example, uh, we're going to deal with a, a pod resource. Um, we're going to create it, update it. It doesn't matter exactly. Uh, but the, what we do first is we make an API request to the API server, and we say, create new pod. 
Um, what that first does is the API server will have a look at all of the mutating webhooks within your Kubernetes cluster, iterate through them all, and see if any of the rules that they define match against the API request you are making. So if they apply to pods, if they apply to creates, things like that. Any that do apply, it will perform the actions that it states, and then it will move on to the next thing. The next thing is CRD validation, uh, schema validation. So if the mutating webhook has made changes, it then checks to make sure that it's still a valid schema that it's, that it's working with, still a valid type. Then it moves on to the pod, uh, sorry, the validating emission policies. So these are the, the new ones that are introduced in 128. Goes through all of those and checks if uh, the rules match or not. If it doesn't match, it will block the API request and return an error. And then finally, does the same for the validating admission controllers, which is the webhooks. Now, that order that I've just gone through is set, uh, but it's worth noting that in each of those blocks, the order that it actually applies those webhooks is not guaranteed. Technically speaking, it generally does it alphabetically today, but there's no guarantee that that is the case, and there's no guarantee that another webhook might be created at some point that, that alters that, that order for you. So don't rely on one webhook running after another webhook. Once we've gone through all that, finally it can be persisted to etcd as long as everything along that chain has said, yes, this is an okay request, go ahead. So that all sounds great, right? We can do all these nice things with webhooks, we can default, we can have policy enforcement, etc. So where is the risk? Um, I want to give you a little quote from uh, a blog post on the Kubernetes website. I'm going to read this verbatim uh, with, with some extras. Admission webhooks can be burdensome to develop and operate. Each webhook must be deployed, monitored, and have a well-defined upgrade and rollback plan. To make matters worse, if a webhook times out or becomes unavailable, the Kubernetes control plane can become unavailable. The Kubernetes control plane can become unavailable. Now, that, I don't know about you, but that's, that's a pretty big risk in my, in my books. I don't want that happening to my clusters. And this is from the Kubernetes blog, pretty big deal. So I wanted to have a look at kind of what the risk is here. So I had a look at 129 of our customers' uh, clusters and, and get some numbers as to how many webhooks we are dealing with. Of those 129, all of them had some form of webhook in place. Um, they had at least one validating and one mutating webhook. Um, overall, they had an average of nine validating webhooks per cluster and seven mutating webhooks per cluster. The cluster that had the most validating was 25, and the most mutating was 15. So this isn't just like a small, small uh, risk we're talking about here. This, this, is, this is quite widespread and in pretty much every cluster. Um, and the numbers here was a mix of dev, production, staging, um, clusters of varying sizes, massive ones, tiny ones, all this kind of thing. So it was a, a, across, across the board. So how bad can things actually get? Seeing as you're all now energized after lunch, I want to play a little game with you all. Uh, I'm going to show you some scenarios uh, of either misconfigured or malicious webhook uh, configurations. And I want you to decide through a show of hands whether you think it's going to break the cluster or not. So raise your hand if you think it is going to break. Keep it down if you think it's going to be fine. Sound good? Yes? Cool. So the first one is a different content type. So in this scenario, our webhook service is going to return a response that has a different content type header to the actual response body. Who thinks that the Kubernetes uh, API server is going to break in this scenario? Things are going to go bad. OK, a few of you. OK, yeah. No, it's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. The API server completely ignores the content type header and just treats everything as YAML. It expects that whatever you're returning back is YAML or JSON, because it also supports both. Um, absolutely fine, doesn't matter. So the next one, uh, a cutoff response. So in this scenario, we're going to set a content length of like a billion. Um, but our actual response is just going to be a normal response. So it's going to effectively wait for, expect more, more data to be returned. Who thinks this is going to break the cluster? A few of you, a few of you, okay, okay. This is fine. So yes, you get an error returned back, um, but the API server correctly understands that, you know, we were expecting more, but it didn't appear. So you get an error, but the, 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 the cluster itself is still OK. So a redirect. So in this scenario, uh, we've got multiple webhooks here. Uh, and the webhook is set to redirect to somewhere else. So when the API server does the request, it's going to get back like a 301 or whatever uh, response to say, go look elsewhere for it. It's going to keep doing that infinitely. 
So it's going to keep sending the API server somewhere else. Who thinks this is going to break the cluster? A few, few more, few more. Actually, this is fine. They've, they've thought about this, and there's a limit of 10 redirects. If it hits 10, it goes, this is ridiculous. I'm going to stop. And you know, throws an error back, but handles it fine. A label override. So this is a misconfiguration of a webhook service. And what this does is it has a mutating webhook that is trying to add labels to uh, the resources being created. So it's trying to say, you know, modified by webhook XYZ, something like that. Um, but it mistakenly overwrites all of the existing labels uh, rather than adding to them. Simple enough to do when you're creating a, a JSON patch uh, response. Who thinks this breaks? OK, not as many. Uh, this breaks. Oh my god, so many pods get created here. So many pods. So in this scenario, when we're creating pods, uh, it overrides the labels on there so that the uh, label selector on the deployments and the replica sets no longer match. So it creates another pod to replace it. Again, 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 again. And eventually, you saturate your entire cluster with hundreds of pods. Um, if you have auto-scaling involved, uh, I hope you've got an upper limit. Put it that way. Um, so yeah, this one isn't great. But this is hopefully easily caught during development, because we check these things before deploying to prod, right? OK, reinvocation. So webhooks have this uh, uh, property on their spec called reinvocation policy. And you can set this to a value called if needed. What this means is if more than one mutating webhook is applied to a request, uh, if the resource has changed, we want to reinvoke our webhook again to make sure it runs against the most up-to-date version of the, the request. In this scenario, we have two webhooks that both want to reinvocate, and they're both changing each time. So we're effectively like adding the timestamp as an annotation, for example. Who thinks this is going to break? OK, few hands, few hands. This is actually fine. Um, the Kubernetes actually will only allow you to, to, re to invoke a webhook twice. So you can only reinvoke once more. After that, it's like, nope, 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 we're done. We're going to move on. We're going we're gonna to do other things. Um, so it says here from the documentation quite clearly, if additional invocations result in further modifications to the object, webhooks are not guaranteed to be invoked again. It's fine. Fork bomb. So this is what I'm calling a fork bomb. It's not technically. But the, the idea of this is it's a webhook that uh, triggers other resources to be created that in turn re-trigger the webhook. Right. So in, in the scenario here, I'm creating a webhook that responds to an event resource being created. And as part of the handling of that webhook, we are creating an event to say we've handled it. So we're going to call, basically call it again. Who thinks this is going to break the cluster? So a few more. It depends in this scenario. So it very much depends. Um, we've seen scenarios of this in production where it's effectively denial of service itself because it's created too many requests and the API server then can't handle it. If you've got a large enough cluster, this, this is likely to happen. Um, also, that resource in this scenario events is going to keep building up in the cluster. So you, you, you're hopefully eventually going to hit some sort of limit, etcd limit, resource limit, whatever. Things are, at, at the very least, going to start slowing down because you've got more resources you're dealing with. Um, so it very much depends in this scenario. OK, finally, uh, data overload. So in this scenario, uh, our response is just going to return as much data as possible. Just, just random junk. We're just going to stream as much data as we can from uh, the crypto rand package in this, in this specific scenario. Uh, we're not going to give it a valid response. We're just going to say, here's a bunch of data. Just keep sending it to the API server. How do we think of this? Going to break the cluster? OK, not many. OK. Yeah, this blows up. Um, the API server just dies. It cannot handle this. Um, to resolve this, I had to restart the API server, effectively like restarting the node or whatever. I was able to, to mitigate this by uh, reducing the timeout seconds property on the webhook itself down to something small. But the default of 10 seconds broke the API server. It did not like all that data coming into it. It just locked up and, and was unusable. So what's the actual risk? I mean, those were, yeah, there was a few, few scenarios, but generally you would have caught them early before it goes to production. So what's the actual risk we're talking about here? So the actual risk of webhooks is more, they're rarely the cause of a problem, of, a, of an incident or whatever, but they have a tendency to exacerbate them, to make a, a situation you're dealing with much worse. So when something falls over and webhooks are then involved, things get much harder to resolve things and, and all that kind of thing. 
And because that webhooks are on that critical path, so we saw earlier that every API recall goes through all of those webhook calls if they, if they match. If they fail and, and, and fail in a, in a non-resilient way, uh, that's going to have a knock-on effect to everything else as we're trying to fix things. So you don't want to be dealing with these things like at, at 2 a.m. when you're dealing to a, with a P1 incident or whatever. Um, so we've seen examples of this. So the Reddit incident, uh, the outage on Pi Day, um, not necessarily related to webhooks exactly, but there was a scenario where they suspected the webhooks were, were at fault. They were causing problems with them debugging, so they, they basically got rid of them while they were investigating. Um, at Giant Swarm, we've seen a couple of issues of this. So during a cluster upgrade, a webhook failed to come back up, uh, which prevented then the API server pod from being created because it couldn't call the webhook and couldn't create itself. Not ideal. Um, we've seen issues with uh, an availability zone dying, and all of the webhook pods were in that availability zone, instantly not available, and then couldn't recreate themselves because they were blocked by themselves. Um, and you know, countless other issues. I've, I've heard people tell me all sorts of stories about this. Um, so basically, they're not really the, the cause of these problems, but if they're not built in a resilient uh, and, and um, self-healing self kind of way, they, they make a, a bad situation much, much worse. So what's the fix? Um, not a huge lot in a lot of scenarios, but there are a few things we maybe can do. Um, one of the things, if you're building these webhooks, please try and set the failure policy to ignore wherever possible. So this means that if the API server fails to call the service behind the, the, the webhook uh, configuration, and it returns an error, it times out whatever, the API server is just going to get on, carry on with whatever it's doing and not stop that creation. So if it's pods that you're creating, it's going to still create the pod even though it failed to call the webhook. Now, this is, this is all well and good, but if you're having webhooks for like security reasons or anything like that, not ideal. You don't want, it to, you don't want this way around it. So it's not every scenario you can do this. Um, wherever possible, please try and make use of things like the namespace selector and the object selector on your webhooks. So this allows you to limit what resources actually trigger against the webhook. If at all possible, please, please, please ignore the kube system namespace in your selectors. You want to make sure that those system critical pods are able to be created uh, wherever possible. Um, and ideally, target specific labels that you know your resources are going to have if you can. Um, wherever possible, uh, auto-remove your webhooks when the service that's backing them scales down to zero. Um, so Caverno is a, is a tool that uh, kind of abstracts webhooks for you so you can do them in a more cloud-native way. They have a really good implementation of this where they have a, a shutdown uh, trap that when they detect that they are the last replica, they will get rid of the webhooks, uh, the webhook configurations within the cluster so that once that pod is gone, those webhooks are no longer going to try and call it. So it, it safely like, cleans up after itself as, it's, as it shuts down, which is, which is very nice. Otherwise, because it's, it, tr it triggers the webhooks against everything, it's going to cause problems for everything else. Um, do you even need the webhook? Uh, if at all possible, maybe whatever you're trying to do can be done as an asynchronous operator that's not blocking. So if whatever you're doing is trying to add some labels on or um, add some annotations or metadata or whatever, maybe that doesn't need to be done at creation, but can be done immediately after creation as a background job, that, the background controller that runs in your, in your cluster that doesn't kind of block that critical path. Um, during an incident, wherever possible, uh, you might want to just scale down your, uh, sorry, you might want to disable your webhooks uh, while you're investigating things and fixing things so that they don't get in the way and make things worse. Don't do this as like your first reaction because you may make things worse by doing so. Um, but if you are finding yourself fighting against some of these webhook services, you may want to scale them down, uh, delete, uh, disable the, the configurations. Have a look in your API server logs to see if there are errors about failed to contact web server, uh, sorry, webhook, uh, or something along those lines is the error message. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, I highly recommend you uh, review this Kubernetes admission control threat model. Um, that's provided by SIG Security. I'll uh, message out these, these links and stuff later. Um, but they've done a really good job of uh, explaining all of the different threats uh, with emission controls and things like that. Uh, and finally, if you can, when it's available, 128 onwards, uh, make use of validating admission policy. So we're going to have a quick look at what this is. Um, so this is cell-based admission control. So unlike 
webhooks that actually call out to a service running in your, in your cluster. This will uh, run some cell expressions in the API server itself. So you have a couple resources that you deal with here, a validating emission policy, which kind of looks like this. You have some match constraints and some validations. It's very similar to how the webhooks look, but again, this runs all in the API server, so there's nothing that can be failing or scaled down that's going to cause issues. Um, so in this scenario, uh, we're creating something that ensures that, our, uh, that, that all deployments have uh, at least three replicas. And then along with that, we have this uh, validating emission policy binding um, you tell it which policy you're, you're associating this with, the validating actions, what to do. In this scenario, we're going to deny because we want to block it. Uh, and then the match resources. So in this scenario, any namespace that has the environment production label on it, that's where we're going to apply this. And this is what it looks like if you don't do that. So here I was trying to do a deployment with a single replica, and you get an error like this. And this was all handled by the API server itself. So as long as you're able to contact the API server and it's running, you can do validation without, without a problem. There's a bunch of other things that also come into this. It's, uh, it's quite a new uh, uh, tech within, within Kubernetes. I highly recommend you having a look at it, but it does require uh, 128 onwards um, in, in a more stable uh, manner. There's things like parameters, um, uh, variables, and like message war custom message warnings and things like that that you can do. So you can have quite dynamic configurations in here that look up from other resources and things like that. Highly recommend looking at the official docs. They are fantastic. There's a lot of detail that they go into. So, in summary, um, webhooks are rarely the actual cause of problems, but they do have a tendency to make things worse. Um, be very, very aware of that critical path, so the, the API requests that go through, go through every single one of these webhooks. It may not necessarily even be webhooks you created. There's a lot of third-party applications that have webhooks as default. We have them with Istio, Kibano, um, LinkedIn, all these kind of things come with webhooks by default. They're not always in the best HA configured um, state, so you may want to review the ones that have been installed that aren't under your control. Ensure that they're resilient and highly available. You want you know, three pods behind all your deployments, multi-AZ, etc. Uh, and where possible in the future, move to validating admission policy instead. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, all of the links and code to the scenarios that I showed you earlier are available at the link at the top or the QR code. Um, if you want to reach out, any more questions, etc., get in touch with me. Um, and thank you very much. All right, we do have time for questions. So, anybody want to ask a question? Anybody want to take pictures? <laughs> So while you're doing the research on all these scenarios, what was the one scenario that made you squint and go, how did that even break things? Anybody else? All right, thank you, Marcus.